Okay, well, I'll have to get up here in this remote location in order to uh, control the slides. But uh, it's a real pleasure for me to, to be here with you all. I think that advancer works, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you, it, can, you can move around. Yeah, it, yeah, it should, should work. So uh, what I want to talk about is a, a, a set of material that I've put together. Uh, it's based from a review paper that I wrote for an interesting situation and is designed to illustrate uh, something of what a research program is as opposed to an isolated experiment. And the intention, uh, in part, is to share with graduate students what, what a research program really is and how universities can collaborate uh, to make a research program fit together. But I initially put it together because one of my former students, Jim Stevens, who did a master's with me, then uh, did his doctorate with John Thomas in pharmacology and has become a toxicologist. And he was co-editing a book and asked me to write a chapter on something that would fit in a toxicology book. Well, part of, uh, of what I will show you today uh, represents the toxic effect of an endogenous hormone. And so I figured that that's what I could write about, and I put this review together to summarize that. It starts with a background that begins with work that was done, uh, part of it here at Kansas State, uh, that Dr. Odie and Dr. Kirchhoff were involved in, and then goes to uh, a lot of work that was done at Missouri and West Virginia uh, over a period from about 1978 or 79 until about 2003 or 4. So it represents a program with, with some time in it. So let's look at... Let's see if this, there it goes. Uh, for background for students, I put in just to remind uh, you of the pattern of hormone during the estrous cycle because it is that pattern that we'll need to look at as we look at this uh, aspect in the postpartum cow. With a normal cycle, we have progesterone rising early in the cycle and then continuing until about day 18 when it drops precipitously and that cow comes back in heat about day 21 on the average. So the two things that we'll highlight eventually in this presentation as uh, playing a particular role in controlling that cycle and coming out as important in the postpartum cow are this pattern of estrogen secretion before LH release that precedes ovulation, the pattern of progesterone secretion and how those two combine together to control the timing of this pattern of release of prostaglandin F2 alpha from the uterus that then causes luteal regression to occur in the return to estrus in the case of an animal that is not pregnant. And that cycle has in it in the cow either two or three follicular waves that contribute to that, cycles in studies that uh, we did, and this is uh, Nassim Ahmad's work, by the way, 20.3 uh, days with two waves, 21.6 with, with three waves in beef cattle. And so we start then with the background of what we normally see in cycling beef cows. If we look back at the literature, fertilization rates are 90 to 100 uh, percent, calving rates uh, from first service in the 50 to 60 percent range. That's work by Sreenan in Ireland. Embryonic and fetal death, the majority of it occurs b before day 18 in, based on the reviews of, of several studies that have been done. And in dairy cows, whoops, I went too fast. In dairy cows, we have this additional losses uh, that occur between day 25 and 50 or 60, uh, usually most of them between day 28 and 45 during placentation. 
that come into the picture. So that's the basic situation with, with cycling cows. When we look at the postpartum cow, then we have a period when she is not fertile early on. Uh, this, these data from some of the early work uh, in dairy cows, ones that were uh, bred before 20 days postpartum, only a 5% conception, increasing as we approach day 30, 39%, then as we go on between 21 and 60, in the 50s after day 60, then going up into the uh, 60s and 70s. Same with beef cattle starting here less than 30 days, 15 to 33 percent in different studies, going up over uh, 50 percent, over 60, and then over 70 uh, later on. So we have involution of the uterus and more cycles occurring than fertility improves in those animals. So what then limits fertility in that postpartum cow? And this will be the uh, set of studies that we'll put together to illustrate that. So we look at some of the early work at Wisconsin. Uh, Cassida and his students published this bulletin uh, in 1968 in which they had a series of these studies. And fertilization rate, when they uh, looked at three days, flushed the oviducts, was 52%. If they looked at pregnancy at 15 or 38 to 44 days, it didn't differ between those two stages and it was 35%. So if we look at that difference, that's 17 percentage points or an estimated embryonic death of 33%. But when they wrote this up in that bulletin, they said fertilization was the problem, not embryo death. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't criticize my mentor that way, but I think he missed that. <laughs> because here's 33% embryonic death that's occurring. So that's a component of it. So if we look at some of the other early studies, we go back to basics again for a minute and look at uh, the ruminant estrous cycle. And we see that as ruminants return from postpartum or begin estrous cycles at puberty. They uh, start with ovulation without estrus and a short luteal phase. And that goes clear back to Grant's work in 1933 with sheep, where they saw that the first ovulation of the breeding season occurred before the first estrus. Then short first cycles postpartum in dairy cows are reported by Mengi working with Cassidy's group at the Lake Mills Farm in Wisconsin in 1962, and Dave Mara, uh, who's veterinarian up at uh, Extension Vet at Michigan State in 1966. Then uh, when Jim Berardinelli and Dwayne Kiesler were graduate students with us, they looked at the uh, puberty in uh, heifers in the case of Berardinelli and, and new lambs in the case of Dwayne, and saw that short luteal phases preceded the first estrus there. So, these are data showing uh, that, that this statement up here is the case. So progesterone secretion uh, patterns in those short first cycles were characterized by Dr. Odie and Dr. Kirchhoff and published in Theriogenology in 1980. And so we know that this kind of pattern uh, is occurring in, in uh, all of these ruminants. And that's in contrast to Duane's pigs where they'll have a normal first cycle in length, but that first corpus luteum does not support pregnancy as well as the later one. So we know then that from uh, work that Bob Bellows and his group did up at Miles City, that cows weaned at 30 days, showed estrus in about four days, formed corpus lutea at that time, and, and also had a short cycle. We know from the work that Cassida and that group had done in the Bulletin 270 and 68 again, and in work that Ramirez Godinas uh, did uh, either here or at Colorado State. That was here, wasn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, in 1982, uh, that ovulation and fertilization were occurring, preceding a short cycle. 
And in our work, we uh, subsequently confirmed that. So we also uh, learned uh, from another set of studies that progesterone was involved in setting the timing of the cycle. And if we gave, whoops, wrong thing again. If we gave progesterone early in the cycle, it shortened the ester cycle and timed an early increase in the secretion of prostaglandin F2 alpha. Now this is a different kind of treatment. Here we're treating with progesterone right after estrus, and it's advancing that secretion of prostaglandin F2 alpha. In the case of the U, that's moving it from day uh, 11 to 14 back to day 8 to 11. So it shortens the cycle to about 12 days. And similarly in the cow, it moves it from day 14 to 17 back to about 11 to 14. So we have a short cycle. So that was shown first in the U by Woody and co-workers at Wisconsin in 1967. And Joe Otterbray in our lab at West Virginia then showed that the increase in prostaglandin was the reason for that short cycle. Then work that was done uh, here by Garrett and co-workers uh, in 1988 in cattle and then in sheep uh, after that. And I couldn't find that paper the other day, but uh, Rod Geiser assured me yesterday that it does exist. <laughs> and uh, that one was in sheep. But what they did was to show uh, that the progesterone early in the cycle advanced the development of the uterus and increased the growth rate of the uh, embryos. And if they gave RU486, it delayed the secretion of F, uh, prostaglandin F2 alpha uh, so that the cycle was lengthened. So here the cycle is shortened uh, with progesterone treatment early, and if you delayed the progesterone contacting its receptors by putting in the receptor blocker, then you lengthen the cycle. So they showed that this hastens the development of the uterine environment and uh, conceptus growth. And then Lawson and Cahill uh, used that uh, knowledge and, and Neil Moore as well to show that you could put embryos in uh, that were older aged at an earlier stage of the cycle if you treated with progesterone early in the cycle, which fit with that change in the environment. And Doug Vincent uh, then used that in our lab when he was postdoc with us to uh, illustrate the control of prostaglandin secretion, including prostaglandin E2. He put 10 day embryos into a sheep that was six days uh, post estrus and had been treated with progesterone to advance the uterus, and then saw that the prostaglandin E2 secretion uh, went up four days earlier in those animals. So from that set of background then, we knew that we could set up a model in the postpartum cow. And so the work that was done then at Missouri and West Virginia was to use in early postpartum cows a model in which we used the treatment that had been used here with norgestimate implants for nine days before ovulation to produce a normal cycle or an untreated control animal to produce a short cycle. We induced ovulation either by weaning, which would provide an estrus here beforehand, or by injection of HCG, which would provide just ovulation but no estrus. So with that model then, uh, we did a whole series of studies. Here's one that Bruce Pratt did uh, to confirm those patterns with the HCG injection rather than the weaning. And we see the short cycle here in the controls and in the norgestimate pretreated animals, a normal cyclic pattern uh, of progesterone. Then Jana Copeland at Missouri did this series of studies and looked at the progesterone secretion. And she found the same thing here in the first six days of the cycle. There was no difference in that 
uh, progesterone pattern between control and progestogen pretreated animals. Uh, the same thing that was true here in Bruce's study. And <clears throat> so from that then we knew that that, that short cycle probably did not uh, occur due to a lack of early support, but we thought we should ask all those questions. And so we ask, is follicular development inadequate? Is support by FSH or LH before ovulation different? Is the luteotropic support by LH limiting? Is the regressing CL not responsive to LH? And Finally then, is the early regressing CL more responsive to prostaglandin F2 alpha? So we look at the answers to those questions and we found that it was essentially no for most of them. And the follicles in the progestin pretreated cows did have more fluid, more LH receptors in both theca and granulosa. This was a study I was uh, talking about where I went out and learned LH receptor assays with uh, nice Winder and Tim Braden and sheared sheep to pay my bill. And, <laughs> and there was more estrogen in the follicular fluid, but all these differences were pretty subtle differences. They weren't the major differences. We published that in 1988. So if we look at the uh, findings relative to some of those other questions, if we look at the plasma progesterone after injection of prostaglandin F2-alpha on day 7, that Jana Copeland did this work at Missouri again, and the pattern of progesterone didn't differ between the control and the pretreated animals there. So the corpora lutea were not more sensitive to prostaglandin. Then if we look at active immunization of the cows against prostaglandin, here we have the control group back here that they regress early, and if they're pretreated with norgestimate, they regress out here at the normal time. But when we gave them uh, an immunization against prostaglandin F2 alpha, the corpora lutea were maintained. Again, that's Jana Copeland's work at Missouri. And she did an additional study in which she hysterectomized the animals and found that that maintained the CL in short cycles. So all of these results up to that point provide evidence that luteal lifespan is not limited by gonadotropic support. Something's happening to cause regression. So then the question becomes, was more prostaglandin F2-alpha secreted early in the cycle in these animals with short cycles? And so we look at the pattern of uh, secretion of prostaglandin F2-alpha, and here's a study that Bill Zollers did in which he treated with oxytocin to stimulate it, and if he did that in these animals with the short cycles, he saw that kind of an increase early. Uh, these were treated on day five. If he waited till day 16 to treat in a normal cycle, then uh, he saw that same kind of a, an increase then. But if he uh, had the normal cyclic animals uh, that were at day five, there was no response. So you put that together and we're seeing a situation that uh, the the response to oxytocin showed to be greater early in the cycle in those short-cycled animals. And so Andy Cooper in our lab uh, looked at that by putting uh, catheters in the posterior vena cava, collecting blood samples uh, for six hours every day, and days four through nine after injecting HCG to cause ovulation and measured the prostaglandin F2-alpha, and here we see very active secretion of prostaglandin F2-alpha in these control animals with the short cycles. When we look at that in the norgestimate pretreated animals, prostaglandin F2-alpha secretion is minimal. So that's during this same period, days four through nine post-HCG. 
in that case. So we've used both of those models. Now Cooper went on to look at what happens to the secretion of prostaglandin F2 alpha when that norgestimate implant is in place. And sure enough, when that implant is there, we see that increase in secretion of prostaglandin F2 alpha. These are daily means in this case. On day three or three and a half out through day eight or nine in those animals. So that secretion then is occurring when that uterus first sees progesterone in that postpartum cow. So then another question becomes, is that secretion at this time necessary in order for the secretion of progesterone to be established as normal in that subsequent cycle? And Sandy Johnson looked at that and blocked that rise in prostaglandin F2-alpha during the progestogen treatment, and that did not prevent the normal cycle. So that meant that the secretion of prostaglandin early did not have to occur then. It wasn't a matter of getting rid of it. But the cows with the expected normal cycles had more progesterone receptors and fewer oxytocin receptors in the uterus than the cows expected to have short cycles. This was in work that Bill Zollers did at Missouri. So we put all of these studies together now, and we come up with the concept that the pretreatment with progesterone is setting up this pattern. And the Missouri group then went on to show that the, sequ the sequence of progesterone and estrogen is necessary to set up those progesterone receptors, decrease the oxytocin receptors, so that the post auditory increase in progesterone can set the timing for increased secretion of prostaglandin F2-alpha to be at the normal time. And that was uh, uh, published by Kelly Keyboards and Mike Smith and Garbrick and that group in 2003. So that finishes that up, and we can summarize then the endocrine situation in that postpartum cow by looking at the control cow here to see what happens. We look at the secretion patterns of all these hormones that were looked at except GnRH, we didn't measure it. And we see that LH is at a relatively minimum level in this early weaned animal, but does increase enough with weaning to cause ovulation. FSH is variable, but there's no particular pattern with it. And LH receptors in the follicles are low, estradiol is low, the growth rate of the follicle is low, it produces low estradiol. There are then few progesterone receptors in the uterine endometrium in Zoller's work. And so after ovulation then, the corpus luteum that's formed produces progesterone, causes this early secretion of prostaglandin F2-alpha, which leads to the short luteal phase. When we go to the progestogen pretreated animal, then progestogen acting at all of these sites puts this together. We have an increase in GnRH pulses during that treatment, an increase in LH pulses part of the time during that treatment, and FSH apparently needs to be at a minimum in one study that Miguel Garcia Wender did that a group of cows had very low FSH. We didn't get normal cycles uh, in very many of the cows, only the ones that had higher FSH. But what's normally happening then with this pretreatment is we have an increase in the LH receptors, increase in estradiol, increase in growth. This is in both the granulosa and the theca of that follicle. Now it produces more estradiol. The progesterone receptors are increased, so after ovulation, the corpus luteum produces progesterone. It sets up the normal timing of secretion of F2-alpha. At day 14 to 17, we have a normal luteal phase. So that summarizes then what we learned relative to the endocrine patterns and how they regulate that cycle in the postpartum cow. If we go back to our model and begin to look at fertility, we can see what happens with fertility. We have the same model again. 
We're now indu inducing the ovulation uh, in these cases. Ah, I'm hitting the wrong button again. By weaning, and we have with the pretreatment the normal cycle, and, and without it, the short cycle. So we're back with that same model. And we start out to look at what happens. First thing to do is confirm what's already reported. Is the oocyte that ovulates at the beginning of the short luteal phase capable of being fertilized and undergoing early development in our cows in West Virginia? So we set up a simple experiment. These are nulliparous, uh, excuse me, multiparous lactating beef cows. They're 18 to 25 days postpartum when we start by putting in an implant. And so we have them set up to be controls with a short cycle or an ergestimate with a normal cycle. Using Bella's uh, technique, we remove the calves here two days before we remove the implants. So it's four days from calf removal to expected estrus, two days from implant removal to expected estrus. And now we have natural service and AI in all of these cows. We let them be bred to a bull and we inseminated them 12 hours after onset of estrus to be very sure that we're getting an opportunity for fertility. Then we removed the oviducts at three days and took blood samples out to day 20 to verify the length of the cycle. And what do we see? Fertilization rate was pretty high, no difference between the short and normal cycles. Development at day three in the uh, embryos recovered from the oviduct to equal to or greater than the four cell stage was 94% in the short cycle and 100% in the progestin pretreated cycle. So we confirmed the earlier work. Then we said, okay, is it capable of being transported into the uterus? And we did the same study, except this time we flushed the uterus on day six, again followed the cycles with blood samples. And here we look at the recovery of oocytes at day six. They are getting into the uterus. There's no significant difference between groups. The fertilization rate, again, not significantly different with relatively small numbers. Uh, a little better in the uh, normal cycle, but not significant. And the four to eight cell stage here equal and 100% in both groups. So that oocyte is developing, or that embryo is developing to that point. So if that's the case, then, and the corpus luteum regression is the limiting factor, we should be able to maintain that pregnancy by providing a progestogen supplement after the cow ovulates. So we put them on MGA uh, using a dosage that Zimbelman and Smith had used at Upjohn and overectomized cows of four milligrams per day. And we give them that out to day 35 and, and diagnose pregnancy. So again, we've got the same model, uh, norgestimate implants and controls, bred the same way and followed with blood samples to make sure what the length of cycle was. So here are the results in our controls. The controls then had no fertility at 35 days as expected, but the ones fed MGA didn't either. That didn't help. And in the norgestimate pretreated, we had about half of them pregnant, not quite in this case, but uh, no difference between the two groups. The difference is between the controls and the norgestimates. So the next, slide, uh, next uh, experiment uh, is to determine whether that oocyte that's released at the beginning of a short cycle is capable not only of fertilization but of continuing development if it's put into a uterus that's normal and prepared for it. So we used an embryo transplant uh, approach for this study. Again, we've got the same model to begin with. We bled and ultrasounded these animals on a daily basis out to day 20, and then flushed at day six and transferred embryos into uh, other lactating beef cows that were cycling. 
And when we did that, here we find that the recovery rates again aren't different, the fertilization rates aren't different, transferable embryos didn't differ, and cows pregnant did not differ significantly. So that says that those embryos are capable of developing if they're taken out of this cow. So something in that cow is killing the embryos. What is that embryotoxic factor? Well, knowing that prostaglandin F2 alpha is secreted at this time, we ask the question, might it be the problem that's causing the death of these embryos? And we look in the literature, and Ralph Maurer and Beyer in 1976 had reported that prostaglandin retarded development of rabbit embryos. So Kevin Brule had graduated with us and gone down to East Tennessee, and he did this study in the rat and found the same thing. And the morula to early blastocyst uh, was what was susceptible to exogenous prostaglandin when uh, Mitch Hockett and Ricky Seals did studies with Neil Schrick, who'd also been with us and gone to Tennessee. And then what Schrick and his co-workers found also was that the quality of embryos was negatively correlated to the concentration of prostaglandin in uterine flushings. So if we look at some of those data, here we see the embryo quality scores of these are cycling uh, animals that are either controls or treated with prostaglandin F2-alpha on day 5 through 8, or 5 through 7, because these are taken out on day 7. And the uh, em embryo quality scores are 1s for the controls, some 2s and a few 3s. In the case of those treated with prostaglandin, they're mostly 4s, or essentially dead embryos. And we look at their morphology, and the uh, controls have progressed mostly to expanded blastocysts. The prostaglandin treated are still morulous. So that morula to blastocyst transition is what is being inhibited by the prostaglandin. So that's happening in the cow as well. So then the hypothesis from all these studies becomes that the regressing corpus luteum in the short luteal phase cow is responsible for low fertility even when exogenous progestogen is provided. And you'll see why we say the regressing corpus luteum, because there's something about its presence there that is doing something. So we start looking for what? We know that it produces prostaglandin, in addition to the prostaglandin produced by the uterus, and we know that it releases oxytocin. Are either of these substances then responsible is what we begin to look at in the next series of experiments. This layout for an initial experiment in the postpartum cows looks complicated as the very devil, but it really isn't. We have control cows that got saline three times per day from days four through seven. A group that got a prostaglandin inhibitor, funixin megalamine or banamine, three times a day. And because Paul Lewis said you have to be sure that it's not just due to maintenance of the corpus luteum, so you should do some with lutectomy. So we did a group in which we gave the banamine three times a day and removed the corpus luteum. So now, that corpus luteum removal occurred on day 7, and we're following these animals then with ultrasound on day 10, 14, 25, and 30 to follow the corpus luteum. We followed these animals all got 150 milligrams of progesterone twice a day. That is the amount that would be produced by a corpus luteum, and so these, the, the corpus luteum was removed in that group. These others had their corpus luteum if it hadn't regressed. And we followed them with ultrasound beforehand. These were all 18 to 24 days postpartum when we started. We're doing pregnancy diagnosis out here at 30 days after breeding. Took blood samples throughout that period to follow things up to day seven. 
And then after the lutectomy, we couldn't follow those the same any longer. So that basic design will be used in a series of experiments that I've combined the results together here. These are two experiments in the postpartum cows. The one, uh, experiment three, is, is designated here is, is the one that was diagrammed in that first uh, case. So we had controls for nixon megalamine and for nixon megalamine plus lutectomy. Then to uh, look back and make sure that the lutectomy itself is not the answer, we had a second experiment with control and lutectomy. So what we see is that the percent pregnant is low in all of these groups except the ones that got both the banamine and the lutectomy. So in the postpartum cow, it took removal of the luteal and uterine progesterone, uh, prostaglandin F2-alpha both in order to achieve 50% fertility. Before that, it was around 20% or less. So, uh, Will Buford came up from Clemson, and he did uh, those experiments, and then two in cycling cows to look at whether prostaglandin F2-alpha had the same kind of effect in the cycling cow, and whether uh, banamine uh, or lutectomy could overcome that kind of effect. Uh, the banamine was used in, whoops, in this experiment just to show that it's not having a toxic effect on its own. Uh, so the control cows have high fertility here, about 70 or 75 percent. The ones that got the banamine, no problem, no change ones that got prostaglandin F2-alpha, low fertility, and in the case of the white bars here, that's the second experiment that was run together. We had these three in one study and these three in the other, and this time lutectomy was all it took to maintain them. We didn't have to give banamine. We're now up to 80% fertility in that group. So what we see then is that prostaglandin F2-alpha is causing this uh, death of the embryo and stopping it at that morula stage. So when Schrick went to Tennessee, he decided to look and see if that happened at other stages. And at day five to eight, period we'd used before, the same effect was found that we'd seen in the other studies. But when you did it at days 10 to 13, it didn't reduce the fertility. It's not different. So this effect is specific to that stage, the morulate blastocyst transition. And is it really due to the prostaglandin and not to oxytocin? So they did this study with oxytocin treatment, and sure enough, it reduced pregnancy rate. But that effect was also blocked by banamine. So that says what the oxytocin was doing in this case is causing the secretion of prostaglandin F2-alpha. So all of these animals in all of those studies received support with uh, progestogen exogenously to uh, take care of the situation of absence of corpoludia uh, in any of those studies. So now we know that prostaglandin F2-alpha is the embryotoxic factor that's interfering with fertility. So we summarize some of these studies and look at what can we do to increase fertility in the postpartum cow. What we see is that with no treatment, she has a conception rate of zero when we do early weaning at day 30 and let her come and heat and breed her. If we give progestogen before estrus, 50%. If we give supplemental progestogen after estrus, no value. If we give the supplemental progestogen and transfer embryos, and this is the reciprocal of the other experiment I told you about, we get 28%, better than zero, but not as good as the pretreatment with embryo transfer, which is 56%. 
Then the supplemental progestogen plus suppressing prostaglandin, we get only 20%. And if we did removal of the CL only, we got 18%. But if we did both, we're up to 50%. But none of those manipulations is as good as letting that cow have a cycle on her own. We had a group of cows that at 30 days already had their own CL when we weaned the calf. Those cows came in heat at that time after the weaning, and so they'd had a prior short cycle. They, they'd gone through a, a corpus luteum of their own, and the fertility in those was 80%, confirming what was in the early literature that more cycles, higher fertility. So if we summarize all of that work then, we look back at the postpartum cow that's mated with her first corpus luteum producing progesterone and low receptors. We have the early uterine secretion, increase in luteal F2 alpha. The two together then have the embryotoxic effect. In cycling animals, we can produce that same thing with exogenous prostaglandin, the corpus luteum releasing prostaglandin F2 alpha and oxytocin, uterine secretion of F2 alpha coming up. Same thing happened with exogenous oxytocin, and we have the embryotoxic effect. If we treat those animals by lutectomy plus banamine in the postpartum animal, or lutectomy in the case of the cycling animal and replace progestogen, then we can block that embryo loss. If we come down to the oxytocin-treated animal, we block that embryo loss by giving banamine. But then the other situation where this applies, and I'll repeat that in the next slide, but is in the embryo transfer industry. Handling the uterus causes oxytocin release, and that would cause increased secretion of F2-alpha. And sure enough, there's increased secretion of F2-alpha in the situation of embryo transfer. And there, Schrick's group showed that embryo loss could be blocked by, again, giving banamine. And later, they increased embryo survival in transferred recipients by that or by using a receptor blocker. And uh, have patented that and put it on the market. And somebody tells me in the last day or two that it's not working as well in practice as it did in the lab, which is not unusual. <laughs> but if we look then at the applications of what's been learned in these studies, treatment with progesterone in the postpartum cow is used extensively to bring late calving cows in line with early calving cows to start cycling in anestrous cows, particularly for artificial insemination, in order to have access to superior genetics. And what that exogenous progestogen is doing is mimicking the luteal phase and initiating that cyclic activity. And then uh, by doing that, it's setting up the conditions for follicular growth, increased LH pulses, increased secretion of estradiol, and the uterine progesterone receptors to time the cycle to be normal. And if we look at the uh, work by Roberts that has shown that handling the uterus increased the secretion of prostaglandin F2 alpha uh, back several years earlier in sheep, and then Srick's results, we see that it can be applied possibly in the embryo transfer industry. Now, uh, Mike Wehrman has had very good results with that in his embryo transfer practice in Montana. So that's what I know about that story, and I, I think it does illustrate how a research program can develop and how collaboration among universities and everybody reading each other's work helps to put it together. Thank you.
Tim. That seems to be the major question that everybody wants to ask. The grad students asked that same question in Missouri yesterday. What's the future of reproductive physiology? Have we worked ourselves out of a job? Uh, I don't think so when dairy cow fertility is 40%. I think we've got a ways to go. So I think there's opportunities. The question becomes, have we in animal science, and Dr. Odie has been working on this extensively in the last couple of years, so he's probably a better one to comment on it than I am, but we've got to do a better job of selling the importance of our industry and that people can't live on lettuce alone. And that's spelled L-E-T-T-U-C-E, -T -T -E, not L-E-T-U-S. <laughs> uh, the vegan culture, the vegetarian culture, the people who think we shouldn't eat animals have had way too much influence. Plant sciences has gotten much better funding than we have. And it's because we haven't done a good job of selling what we have to offer. Dr. Cora is spending a lot of time doing that with certified Angus beef. Uh, the Animal Agriculture Alliance is working on it all the time, et cetera, but we're, we're still not getting the job done. We've got too many teachers in grade schools who have no knowledge whatsoever of animal agriculture. They think it's cruel. They think it's factory farming. Uh, and we, we need to dispel those images. Now, how do we do that? We do what we call kitty days. We bring in kindergarten through third grade and some younger and occasional ones older for four days in April. And we take three to 6,000 students through our farm. It varies from year to year. It went down a little when we started charging for it, which, which I objected to, but we still charge two bucks a kid uh, to try to offset some of our expenses. Uh, but uh, that is something that is very popular with the schools and students, and they come back for. Uh, week before last, I was doing uh, four labs on reproductive management in the uh, sophomore animal science class, and on Friday did the same program uh, on pregnancy diagnosis in sheep for two busloads of fifth graders from Charleston. The fifth graders ask better questions than the sophomores. <laughs> and I think that tells you something. Uh, we're probably pitching our arguments at the wrong level. They've already been uh, set in their ways by the time they're, they're teenagers. Uh, so, uh, that, that's the thing that I find when we go out to, to uh, different situations. We do a program for eighth graders in Marion County uh, where we take a number of these demonstrations out to them. And the, the goal of the Marion County people is to interest those uh, students in uh, participating in the VOAG and FFA programs. And when we go out there and do that, uh, we get a lot of questions from them. And they're always accompanied by a few mothers and a lot of teachers. Questions some of those mothers ask can be embarrassing. They, they really don't know anything about reproduction in animals or themselves. <laughs> and and uh, they'll sidle up to you and, well, what about such and such? <laughs> So uh, I think education is the answer, Tim. We've got to do a better job of that. And, uh, uh, th but there are going to be some, some reproduction positions available. There's a bunch of people like me who are hitting 70 and 75, and, and I'm going to quit one of these days or just drop dead trying, you know.
You won't sick Milo Wiltbank on me if I answer this, will you? <laughs> because I think the biggest problem is GNRH. And what we're doing with GNRH is we're ovulating follicles prematurely. The idea was to avoid ovulating aged follicles because of embryo death. And now we ovulate immature follicles and we also cause embryo death. Why don't we just let that cow come and heat? If we'll just let that cow come and heat and check heat and breed her accordingly. Well, the simple illustration is Nassim Ahmad. When we gave Nassim Ahmad a ultras an ultrasound machine and put him out there to study follicular waves in the dairy herd, the conception rate of the cows that he was breeding went from 35% that the farm crew was getting beforehand to 65 and 70%. And all he was doing was watching those cows every other day with the ultrasound, watching the follicular growth, and checking heat twice a day every day. Previous to Nassim, Char Scheffel, now Char Farron, who's on the faculty at North Carolina, we put her out there in the dairy herd. Conception rates were 35 to 40 percent beforehand. Char had conception rates of 60 and 65 percent. Les Growl, veterinarian at Penn State, went into their mastitis herd for one of our Northeast studies we were doing. This is uh, data that are published uh, by uh, Dave Townsend and, and uh, others in the group. Dave was a senior author on it uh, in animal science uh, five or six, eight years ago. Uh, Les went into that uh, mastitis herd at Penn State. They had conception rates of 35-40%. Les was getting over 70%. All he had was the ultrasound machine, and he personally checked eating bread to cows. So if we'll quit messing with cows and leave the drugs on the shelf, in that case, there's nothing wrong with using progestogen to help cows start cycle or to synchronize cows or use prostaglandin to synchronize cows. But if we quit trying to control ovulation and insist on fixed time AI, I think we can solve a lot of the problem right there. But you do have to check heat, and you have to check heat more than 30 minutes a day. Mike Smith has data that shows that. You have to spend more time. Uh, the studies that, that I'm helping a grad student do right now uh, we treated eight cows with, uh, that had corpoludia with prostaglandin, and we caught eight of the eight in heat. And uh, I checked evenings, she checked mornings, the days I couldn't be there, uh, Hoda Nickpour checked, and we spent an hour each time morning and evening. Those were beef cows, and we caught all of them in heat. The better job of heat checking you do, the better job of breeding you'll do. Now, I have to be careful how strongly I say that because you and I were just in a meeting where there's five salesmen of GNRH. You're right. And I never know which one of them might cut my chops right out from under me. Yeah, yes, guys. Uh, progesterone blip that we were always, re all of us were reporting back uh, years ago, uh, before the first S is nothing more than the uh, ovulation in short luteal phase. Yeah, 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 that's exactly what it was. We didn't know until we, until we measured it and until we took those corporate, I mean, Dwayne, uh, with, when Dwayne did the sheep, uh, he would laparotomize those uh, ewe lambs, and they'd have corpse luteum on the ovary. Uh, when Jim did the uh, heifers, we took those out by supervaginal incision, looked at the ovary, and there it was, corpse luteum. Sometimes in the heifers, they appeared 
not to always have ovulated, but they luteinized. Even if there wasn't a stigma on the surface, there was a luteal structure there. But in, in the sheep, it was always an ovulating structure.